Welcome to the MD Edge Daily News for the final day of summer. I'm your host, Nick Andrews. And I'm MD Edge editor, Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, unprecedented efficacy in psoriasis for a novel oral agent. Also today, IgA vasculitis may be more common in adults than previously thought. And later, a one-step gestational diabetes screen does not improve outcomes. But we begin today with new insights into celiac disease. Even if you think you know about celiac disease, you probably don't. At least that's what Dr. Joseph Murray says. Dr. Murray is a gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic. He spoke at the 2018 Annual Perspectives in Rheumatic Diseases in Las Vegas. First of all, recent research shows that the disease can present without any GI symptoms at all. Secondly, the disease is much more common than originally thought. Dr. Murray says that this is relevant to rheumatologists because it can cause rheumatic symptoms and is more likely to attract patients with certain rheumatic conditions. The question is what you should do if you suspect a patient has celiac disease. Dr. Murray suggests referring the patient to a gastroenterologist. However, it is important to note that some of these patients may not be able to adequately absorb oral medications. The main way to test a patient for celiac disease is through serology prior to gluten-free diet. Therefore, it is crucial not to direct the patient to immediately begin a gluten-free diet. Additionally, it is often difficult to convince a patient who is already on a gluten-free diet to quit the diet. However, the gluten-free diet is dramatically successful treatment even if a patient doesn't need the diet. Dr. Murray says that it is a nutritionally adequate diet and he doesn't argue with success. A novel oral small molecule performed impressively in a phase two clinical trial of 267 adults with moderate to severe psoriasis. The molecule selectively targets tyrosine kinase 2 signaling pathways that are critical in the pathogenesis of psoriasis. This is according to a presentation of the results at the 2018 Annual Congress of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venerology. The study was a 12-week, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multicenter study that examined different regimens of the drug. The primary outcome was 75% or greater reduction from baseline in the Psoriasis Area and Severity Index Score, or PASI-75, at week 12. Researchers report that the agent outperformed placebo in a dose-dependent fashion starting at the 3 mg per day dose. One striking finding in the study was that when the drug was stopped for a month at the end of the 12-week treatment period, the PASI-75 response was maintained, as were other clinical benefits. Dr. James Kruger is the head of the Laboratory of Investigative Dermatology and a professor at Rockefeller University in New York. Dr. Kruger has previously examined cyclosporine for patients like these and notes that after stopping that treatment, the disease roared back for every single patient. He also states that there were no major safety signals with the novel treatment that would be cause for concern. You can read more about the findings, including an explanation of how the TYK2 inhibitor works in psoriasis, by clicking the link in the podcast description. IgA vasculitis has a reputation as an illness of childhood, but one rheumatologist cautions that it can strike adults as well and that it is often much more severe later in life. She also warns that it's likely not as rare as physicians assume. Dr. Alexandra Villaforte is a rheumatologist at the Cleveland Clinic. She spoke on this topic at the 2018 Annual Perspectives in Rheumatic Diseases in Las Vegas. She says that in children, this is a disease that is frequently self-limited and that most of these patients do not need treatment and do not relapse. However, she notes that the disease is more resistant to treatment, is often chronic, and prone to frequent relapses over the years. According to a study published in a 2014 edition of the Journal of Korean Medical Science, 80% of children experienced complete recovery, 
compared with just 40% of adults. Furthermore, 2% of children experienced renal failure compared with 10% of adults. Current guidelines suggest that patients be monitored for chronic kidney disease for eight months after disease onset. However, Dr. Villaforte says that it's better to monitor them for 12 months. She also notes that treatment is tricky and that watching patients doesn't seem like enough because of the risk of kidney problems. But there's currently no good evidence supporting early treatment. And finally today, there is a one-step protocol for gestational diabetes screening, which increased diagnosis by 41%, but with no evidence of improvement in either maternal or neonatal outcomes. This is according to the results of a before and after cohort study of women published in Obstetrics and Gynecology. In the study, researchers compared data from more than 23,000 women who received prenatal care between 2009 and 2014. About 60% of the women were cared for in the Kaiser Permanente system. The researchers report that overall, adopting the one-step approach resulted in a 41% increase in the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. But this was not accompanied by better outcomes for moms or babies. They also report that the incidence of gestational diabetes increased at Kaiser from 7% before guidelines recommending the one-step test to 11% after. And for women who were seen by providers outside the Kaiser system, gestational diabetes diagnosis increased from 10% to 11%. The one-step test is a 75-gram, two-hour oral glucose tolerance test that was recommended to all pregnant women in 2010. However, the traditional two-step test is still commonly used. And that concludes the Friday edition of the MD Edge Daily News. As always, links to these stories can be found in the show notes. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the Daily News wherever you enjoy your podcasts. For MD Edge... I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm Nick Andrews. Don't forget the MD Edge CardioCast is all new today. We bring you back to the beer garden in Munich for part two of our debrief on ESC 2018. You can listen to the CardioCast, the daily news, and all of our audio offerings wherever podcasts are found.